This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. China and the Chinese by Herbert Allen Giles. Lecture 5 Taoism. China is popularly supposed to have three religions. Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism. The first is not, and never has been, a religion, being nothing more than a system of social and political morality. The second is indeed a religion, but an alien religion. Only the last, and the least known, is of native growth. The Chinese themselves get over the verbal difficulty by calling these the Three Doctrines. There have been, at various epochs, other religions in China, and some still remain. The above, however, is the classification commonly in use, all other religions having been regarded, up to recent times, as devoid of spiritual importance. Mohammedanism appeared in China in 628 AD, and is there to this day, having more than once threatened the stability of the empire. In 631, the Nestorian Christians arrived, to become later on a flourishing sect, though all trace of them, beyond their famous tablet, has long since vanished. It has also been established in recent years that the Zoroastrians, and subsequently the Manichaeans, were in China in these early centuries, but nothing now remains of them except the name, a specially invented character which was equally applied to both. In the twelfth century the Jews had a synagogue at Kaifeng Fu, in central China, but it is not absolutely certain when they first reached the country. Some say immediately after the captivity, others put it much later. In 1850 several Hebrew rolls of parts of the Pentateuch, in the square character, with vowel points, were obtained from the above city. There were then no professing Jews to be found but in recent years a movement has been set on foot to revive the old faith. Roman Catholicism may be said to have existed in China since the close of the 16th century, though there was actually an archbishop of Peking, Jean de Montecorvino, who died there in 1330. In the last year of the 18th century, the first Protestant missionary arrived. The first American missionaries followed in 1830, they found China, as it is now, nominally under the sway of the three doctrines. So much has been written on Confucianism, and so much more on Buddhism, that I propose to confine myself entirely to Taoism, which seems to have attracted too little the attention of the general public. In fact, a quite recent work, which professes to deal, among other things, with the history of China, omits all discussion of this particular religion. Taoism is the religion of Tao. As to what Tao is, or what it means, we are told upon the highest authority that it is quite impossible to say. This does not seem a very hopeful beginning, but even the weariest river winds somewhere safe to see. And I shall therefore make an effort to set before you a clue, which, I trust, will lead toward at any rate a partial elucidation of the mystery. At some unknown period in remote antiquity, there appears to have lived a philosopher, known to posterity as Lao Tzu, who taught men, among other things, to return good for evil. His parentage, birth and life have been overloaded in the course of centuries with legend. Finally, he is said to have foreseen a national cataclysm and to have disappeared into the West, leaving behind him a book now called the Tao De Jing, which, for many reasons, he could not possibly have written. The little we really know of Lao Tzu is gathered from traditional utterances of his, scattered here and there in the works of later disciples of his school. Many of these sayings, though by no means all of them, with much other matter of a totally different character, have been brought together in the form of a treatise, 
and the heterogeneous whole has been ascribed to Lao Tzu himself. Before proceeding with our examination of Tao, it is desirable to show why this work may safely be regarded as a forgery of a later age. Attempts have been made, by the simple process of interpolation in classical texts, to prove that Lao Tzu lived in the same century as that in which Confucius was born, and also that, when the former was a very old man, the two sages met, and further, that the interviews ended very much to the astonishment of Confucius. All this, however, has been set aside by the very best native scholarship ever produced in China, as the work of later hands. Further, there was another philosopher of the same name who really was contemporary with Confucius, and it is held by many Chinese critics that the two have been confused, perhaps with malice aforethought. We can only say for certain that after Lao Tzu came Confucius. At what interval we do not know. Now, in all the works of Confucius, whether as writer or as editor, and throughout all his posthumously published discourses, there is not a single word of allusion either to Lao Tzu or to this treatise. The alleged interviews have been left altogether unnoticed. One hundred years after Confucius came Mencius, China's second sage. In all his pages of political advice to feudal nobles, and all his conversations with his disciples, much more voluminous than the discourses of Confucius, there is equally no allusion to Lao Tzu, nor to the treatise. It has been pointed out by an eminent Chinese critic of the 15th and 16th centuries that Mencius spent his life chiefly in attacking the various heterodox systems which then prevailed, such as the extreme altruistic system of Mordi and the extreme egoistic system of Yang Zhu, and it is urged, in my opinion with overwhelming force, that if the Tao De Jing had existed in the days of Mencius, it must necessarily have been recognized and treated as a mischievous work, likely to alienate men's minds from the one perfect and orthodox teaching, Confucianism. Zhuangzi, a philosopher of the 4th century BC, devoted himself to elucidating and illuminating the teaching of Lao Tzu. His work, which has survived to the present day, will shortly occupy our attention. For the moment it is only necessary to say that it contains many of the Master's traditional sayings, but never once mentions a treatise. In the third century BC there lived another famous Taoist writer, Han Fei Tzu, who devotes the best part of two whole sections of his work to explaining and illustrating the sayings of Lao Tzu. Yet he never mentions the treatise. He deals with many sayings of Lao Tzu now to be found in the treatise, but he does not take them in the order in which they now stand, and he introduces several others which do not occur at all in the treatise, having apparently been overlooked by the compiler. In the second century BC there lived another famous Taoist writer, Huainan Tzu, who devotes a long chapter to illustrating the doctrines of Lao Tzu. He never mentions a book. One hundred years B.C. comes the historian Sima Qian, whose brilliant work, the first of the dynastic histories, I have already had occasion to bring to your notice. In his brief memoir of Lao Tzu, he does mention a book in five thousand and more characters, but he mentions it in such a way as to make it clear beyond all doubt that he himself could never have seen it. And moreover, in addition to the fact that no date is given, either of the birth or death of Lao Tzu, the account is so tinged with the supernatural as to raise a strong suspicion that some part of it did not really come from the pen of the great historian. About two hundred years later appeared the first Chinese dictionary, already alluded to in a previous lecture. This work was intended as a collection of all the written characters known at date of publication, and we can well imagine that, with Lao Tzu's short treatise before him, there would be no difficulty in including all the words found therein. Such, however, is not the case. 
there are many characters in the treatise which are not to be found in the dictionary, and in one particular instance the omission is very remarkable. Much other internal evidence against the genuineness of this work might here be adduced. I will content myself with a single and a ludicrous item, which shows how carelessly it was pieced together. Sentences occur in the Tao Te Ching which positively contain, in addition to some actual words by Lao Tzu, words from a commentator's explanation, which have been mistaken by the forger for a part of Lao Tzu's own utterance. Add to this the striking fact that the great mass of Chinese critical scholarship is entirely averse to the claims put forward on behalf of the treatise, a man who believes in it as the genuine work of Lao Tzu being generally regarded among educated Chinese as an amiable crank, much as many people now regard anyone who credits the plays of Shakespeare to Lord Bacon, and I think we may safely dismiss the question without further ado. It will be more interesting to turn to any sayings of Lao Tzu which we can confidently regard as genuine, and those are such as occur in the writings of some of the philosophers above mentioned, from which they were evidently collected by a pious impostor, and with the aid of unmistakable padding were woven into the treatise, of which we may now take a long leave. Lao Tzu imagined the universe to be informed by an omnipresent, omnipotent principle, which he called Tao. Now this word Tao means primarily a road, a way, and Lao Tzu's principle may therefore be conveniently translated by the way. Fearing, however, some confusion from the use of this term, the philosopher was careful to explain that the way which can be walked upon is not the eternal way. But he never tells us definitely what the way is. In one place he says it cannot find expression in words. In another he says, those who know do not tell, those who tell do not know. The latter saying was used by a famous poet as a weapon of ridicule against the treatise. If those who know, he argued, do not tell, how comes it that Lao Tzu puts his own knowledge into a book of five thousand and more words. We are assured, however, by Lao Tzu that, just as without going out of doors we can know the whole world, so without looking out of the window we can know the way. Again we have, without moving you shall know, without looking you shall see, without doing you shall achieve. Meanwhile, we are left to gather from isolated maxims some shadowy idea of what Lao Tzu meant by the way. It seems to have been a perpetual accommodation of self to one's surroundings, with the minimum of effort, all progress being spontaneous, and in the line of least resistance. From this it is a mere step to doing nothing at all, the famous doctrine of inaction, with all its paradoxes, which is really the criterion of Lao Tzu's philosophy, and will be always associated with Lao Tzu's name. Thus he says, perfect virtue does nothing, and consequently there is nothing which it does not do. Again, the softest things in the world overcome the hardest. That which has no substance enters where there is no crevice. Leave all things to take their natural courses, and do not interfere. Only he who does nothing for his life's sake can be truly said to value his life. Govern a great nation as you would cook a small fish. Do not overdo it. Do not try to force results. The well-known Greek injunction, not to go beyond one's destiny, oak huper moron, may well have fallen from Lao Tzu's lips. All this is the way, which Lao Tzu tells us is like the drawing of a bow. It brings down the high and exalts the low, reducing all things to a uniform plane. He also says that if the way prevails on earth, horses will be used for agricultural purposes. If the way does not prevail, they will be used for war. 
Many of Lao Tzu's sayings are mere moral maxims for use in everyday life. Put yourself behind, and the world will put you in front. Put yourself in front, and the world will put you behind. To the good I will be good. To the not good I would also be good, in order to make them good. Altogether, with the comparatively few scraps of Lao Tzu's wisdom to be found in the treatise, we should be hard put to understand the value of Tao, and still more to find sufficient basis for a philosophical system, were it not for his disciple, Zhuangzi, of the 4th century BC, who produced a work expanding and illustrating the way of his great master, so rich in thought, and so brilliant from a literary point of view, that, although branded since the triumph of Confucianism, with the brand of heterodoxy, it still remains a storehouse of current quotation and a model of composition for all time. Let us go back to Tao, in which, Zhuangzi tells us, man is born, as fishes are born in water. For, as he says in another place, there is nowhere where Tao is not. But Tao cannot be heard. Heard, it is not Tao. It cannot be seen. Seen, it is not Tao. It cannot be spoken. Spoken, it is not Tao. Although it imparts form, it is itself formless and cannot therefore have a name, since form precedes name. The unsubstantiality of Tao is further dwelt upon as follows. Were Tao something which could be presented, there is no man but would present it to his sovereign or to his parents. Could it be imparted or given, there is no man but would impart it to his brother or give it to his child. But this is impossible, for unless there is a suitable endowment within, Tao will not abide, and unless there is outward correctness, Tao will not operate. It would seem, therefore, that Tao is something which altogether transcends the physical senses of man, and is correspondingly difficult of attainment. Zhuangzi comes thus to the rescue. By absence of thought, by absence of cogitation, Tao may be known. By resting in nothing, by according in nothing, Tao may be approached. By following nothing, by pursuing nothing, Tao may be attained. What there was before the universe was Tao. Tao makes things what they are, but is not itself a thing. Nothing can produce Tao, yet everything has Tao within it, and continues to produce it without end. Rest in inaction, says Zhuangzi, and the world will be good of itself. Cast your slough, spit forth intelligence, ignore all differences, become one with the infinite, release your mind, free your soul, be vacuous, be nothing. Zhuangzi lays a special emphasis on the cultivation of the natural as opposed to the artificial. Horses and oxen have four feet, that is the natural. Put a halter on a horse's head, a string through a bullock's nose, that is the artificial. A drunken man who falls out of a cart, though he may suffer, does not die. His bones are the same as other people's, but he meets his accident in a different way. His spirit is in a condition of security. He is not conscious of riding in the cart, neither is he conscious of falling out of it. Ideas of life, death, fear, etc., cannot penetrate his breast, and so he does not suffer from contact with objective existences. And if such security is to be got from wine, how much more is it to be got from Tao? The doctrine of relativity in space and time, which Zhuangzi deduces from Lao Tzu's teachings, is largely introduced by the disciple. There is nothing under the canopy of heaven greater than an autumn spikelet. 
a vast mountain is a small thing. The universe and I came into being together, and all things therein are one. In the light of Tao, affirmative is reconciled with negative, objective is identified with subjective, and when subjective and objective are both without their correlates, that is the very axis of Tao, and when that axis passes through the centre at which all infinities converge, positive and negative alike blend into an infinite one. Thus, morally speaking, we can escape from the world and self, and can reverse and look down upon the world's judgment, while in the speculative region we get behind and beyond the contradictions of ordinary thought and speech. A perfect man is the result. He becomes, as it were, a spiritual being. As Zhuangzi puts it, Were the ocean itself scorched up, he would not feel hot. Were the Milky Way frozen hard, he would not feel cold. Were the mountains to be riven with thunder, and the great deep to be thrown up by storm, he would not tremble. In such case he would mount upon the clouds of heaven, and drive the sun and moon before him, would pass beyond the limits of this external world, where death and life have no more victory over man. We have now an all-embracing one beyond the limits of this world, and we have man perfected and refined until he is no longer a prey to objective existences. Lao Tzu has already hinted at the whence and O oh, heavens the whither. He said that to emerge was life, and to return was death. Zhuang Tzu makes it clear that what man emerges from is some transcendental state in the infinite, and that to the infinite he may ultimately return. How, he asks, do I know that love of life is not a delusion after all? How do I know that he who dreads to die is not like a child who has lost the way and cannot find his home? Those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow, those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. While they dream, they do not know that they dream. Some will even interpret the very dream they are dreaming, and only when they awake do they know it was a dream. By and by comes the great awakening, and then we find out that this life is really a great dream. Fools think they are awake now, and flatter themselves they know if they are really princes or peasants. Confucius and you are both mere dreams, and I who say you are dreams, I am but a dream myself. Take no heed, he adds, of time, nor of right and wrong, but passing into the realm of the infinite, find your final rest therein. An abstract infinite, however, soon ceased to satisfy the natural cravings of the great body of Taoist followers. Zhuangzi had already placed the source of human life beyond the limits of our visible universe, and in order to secure a return thither, it was only necessary to refine away the grossness of our material selves according to the doctrine of the way. It thus came about that the one in whose obliterating unity all seemingly opposed conditions were to be indistinguishably blended, began to be regarded as a fixed point of dazzling intellectual luminosity in remote ether, around which circled for ever and ever, in the supremest glory of motion, the souls of those who had successfully passed through the ordeal of life, and who had left the slough of humanity behind them. Let me quote some lines from a great Taoist poet, Su Kong Tu, written to support this view. His poem consists of twenty-four stanzas, each twelve lines in length, and each dealing with some well-known phase of Taoist doctrine. Expenditure of force leads to outward decay. 
spiritual existence means inward fullness. Let us revert to nothing and enter the absolute, hoarding up strength for energy. Freighted with eternal principles athwart the mighty void, where cloud masses darken and the wind blows ceaseless around, beyond the range of conceptions let us gain the centre, and there hold fast without violence, fed from an inexhaustible supply. In this, the first stanza, we are warned against taxing or even using our physical powers, instead of aiming, as we should, at a purely spiritual existence, by virtue of which we shall ultimately be wafted away to the distant centre in the infinite. Lo, the immortal, born by spirituality, his hand grasping a lotus flower, away to time everlasting, trackless through the regions of space. These four lines from stanza five give us a glimpse of the liberated mortal on his upward journey. The lotus flower, which the poet has placed in his hand, is one of those loans from Buddhism to which I shall recur by and by. As iron from the mines, as silver from lead, so purify thy heart, leaving the limpid and clean. Like a clear pool in spring, with its wondrous mirrored shapes, so make the spotless and true, and riding the moonbeam, revert to the spiritual. These eight lines from stanza seven, which might be entitled Smelting, show us the refining process by which spirituality is to be attained. Seclusion and abandonment of the artificial are also extolled in stanza 15. Following our own bent, let us enjoy the natural, free from curb, rich with what comes to hand, hoping some day to be with the infinite to build a hut beneath the trees, with uncovered head to pore over poetry, knowing only morning and eve, but not what season it may be. Then, if happiness is ours, why must there be action? If of our own selves we can reach this point, can we not be said to have attained? Utterances of this kind are responsible for the lives of many Taoist hermits, who from time to time have withdrawn from the world, devoting themselves to the pursuit of true happiness in the mountains. After gazing abstractedly upon expression and substance, the mind returns with a spiritual image, as when seeking the outlines of waves, as when painting the glory of spring. The changing shapes of wind-swept clouds, the energies of flowers and plants, the rolling breakers of ocean, the crags and cliffs of mountains, all these are like mighty Tao, skillfully woven into earthly surroundings. To obtain likeness without form, is not that to possess the man? This stanza means that man should become like the contour of waves, like the glory of spring, something which to a beholder is a mental image, without constant physical form or substance. Then motion supervenes, not motion as we know it, but a transcendental state of revolution in the infinite. This is the subject of stanza 24. Like a whirling water-wheel, like rolling pearls. Yet how are these worthy to be named? They are but adaptations for fools. There is the mighty axis of earth, the never-resting pole of heaven, let us grasp their clue, and with them be blended in one, beyond the bounds of thought, circling forever in the great void, an orbit of a thousand years. Yes, this is the key to my theme. All that might be dignified by the name of pure Taoism ends here. From this point, the descent to lower regions is both easy and rapid. I'm not speaking now in a chronological sense, but of the highest intellectual point reached by the doctrines of Taoism, which began to decline long before the writer of this poem, himself a pure Taoist of the 10th century, was born. The idea mentioned above, that the grosser elements of man's nature might be refined away, 
and immortality attained, seems to have suggested an immortality not merely in an unseen world, but even in this one, to be secured by an imaginary elixir of life. Certain at any rate it is, that so far back as a century or so before the Christian era, the desire to discover this elixir had become a national craze. The following story is historical, and dates from about 200 B.C. A certain person, having forwarded some elixir of immortality to the prince of Jing, it was received as usual by the doorkeeper. "'Is this to be swallowed?' inquired the chief warden of the palace. "'It is,' replied the doorkeeper. Thereupon the chief warden purloined and swallowed it. At this the prince was exceedingly angry, and ordered his immediate execution. But the chief warden sent a friend to plead for him, saying, "'Your Highness's servant asked the doorkeeper if the drug was to be swallowed, and as he replied in the affirmative, your servant accordingly swallowed it. The blame rests entirely with the doorkeeper. Besides, if the elixir of life is presented to your highness, and because your servant swallows it, your highness slays him, that elixir is clearly the elixir of death, and for your highness thus to put to death an innocent official is simply for your highness to be made the sport of men." the prince spared his life. The later Taoist was not content with attempts to compound an elixir. He invented a whole series of physical exercises, consisting mostly of positions or postures, in which it was necessary to sit or stand, sometimes for an hour or so at a time, in the hope of prolonging life. Such absurdities as swallowing the saliva three times in every two hours were also held to be conducive to long life. There is perhaps more to be said for a system of deep breathing, especially of morning air, which was added on the strength of the following passage in Zhuangzi. The pure men of old slept without dreams, and waked without anxiety. They ate without discrimination, breathing deep breaths, for pure men draw breath from their uttermost depths, the vulgar only from their throats. A Chinese official with whom I became acquainted in the island of Formosa was outwardly a Confucianist, but inwardly a Taoist of the deepest dye. He used to practice the above exercises and deep breathing in his spare moments, and strongly urged me to try them. Apparently they were no safeguard against malarial fever, of which he died about a year or so afterward. Associated closely with the elixir of immortality is the practice of alchemy, which beyond all doubt was an importation from Greece by way of Bactria. We read in the historical record, under date 133 BC, of a man who appeared at court and persuaded the emperor that gold could be made out of cinnabar or red sulphide of mercury, and that if dishes made of the gold thus produced were used for food, the result would be prolongation of life, even to immortality. He pretended to be immortal himself, and when he died, as he did within the year, the infatuated emperor believed, in the words of the historian, that he was only transfigured and not really dead, and accordingly gave orders to continue the experiments. For many centuries, the attempt to turn base metal into gold occupied a leading place in the researches of Chinese philosophers. Volumes have been written on the subject, and are still studied by a few. The best known of these has been attributed to a Taoist hermit, who flourished in the second century AD, and was summoned to court, but refused the invitation, being, as he described himself, a lowly man, living simply and with no love for power and glory. The work in question was actually mistaken for a commentary on the Book of Changes, mentioned in a former lecture, though it is in reality a treatise upon alchemy, and also upon the concoction of pills of immortality. It was forwarded to me some years ago by a gentleman in America, with a request that I would translate it as a labour of love, 
but I was obliged to decline what seemed to me a useless work, especially as the book was really written by another man, of the same name as the hermit, who lived more than twelve hundred years later. The author is said to have ultimately succeeded in compounding these pills of immortality, and to have administered one by way of experiment to a dog, which at once fell down dead. He then swallowed one himself, with the same result, whereupon his elder brother, with firm faith, and undismayed by what he saw before him, swallowed a third pill. The same fate overtook him, and this shook the confidence of a remaining younger brother, who went off to make arrangements for burying the bodies. But by the time he had returned, the trio had recovered, and were straightway enrolled among the ranks of the immortals. As another instance of the rubbish in which the modern Taoist delights to believe, I may quote the story of the Prince of Huainan, 2nd century B.C., who is said, after years of patient experiment, to have finally discovered the elixir of life. Immediately on tasting the drug, his body became imponderable, and he began to rise heavenward. Startled, probably, by this new sensation, he dropped the cup out of which he had been drinking into the courtyard, whereupon his dogs and poultry finished up the dregs, and were soon sailing up to heaven after him. It was an easy transition from alchemy and the elixir of life to magic and the black art in general. Those Taoists who, by their manner of life or their reputed successes in the above two fields of research, attracted public attention, came to be regarded as magicians or wizards, in communication with and in control of the unseen powers of darkness. The accounts of their combats with evil spirits, to be found in many of the lower-class novels, are eagerly devoured by the Chinese, who even now frequently call in Taoist priests to exorcise some demon which is supposed to be exerting an evil influence on the family. As a specimen, there is a story of a young man who had fallen under the influence of a beautiful young girl when he met a Taoist priest in the street, who started on seeing him, and said that his face showed signs that he had been bewitched. Hurrying home, the young man found his door locked, and on creeping softly up to the window and looking in, he saw a hideous devil, with a green face and jagged teeth like a saw, spreading a human skin on the bed and painting it with a paintbrush. The devil then threw aside the brush, and giving the skin a shake-out, just as you would a coat, cast it over his shoulders, and lo, there stood the girl. The story goes on to say that the devil girl killed the young man, ripping him open and tearing out his heart, after which the priest engaged in terrible conflict with her. Finally, and here we seem to be suddenly transported to the story of the fisherman in the Arabian Nights, she became a dense column of smoke curling up from the ground, and then the priest took from his vest an uncorked gourd and threw it right into the midst of the smoke. A sucking noise was heard, and the whole column was drawn into the gourd, after which the priest corked it up closely and carried it away with him. The search for the elixir of life was too fascinating to be readily given up. It was carried on with more or less vigour for centuries, as we learn from the following memorial to the throne, dated from the ninth century A.D., presented by an aggrieved Confucianist. Of late years the court has been overrun by a host of professors who pretend to have the secret of immortality. Now, supposing that such things as immortals really did exist, would they not be likely to hide themselves in deep mountain recesses, far from the ken of man? On the other hand, persons who hang about the vestibules of the rich and great, and brag of their wonderful powers in big words, what are they more than common adventurers in search of pelf? How should their nonsense be credited, and their drugs devoured? Besides, even medicines to cure bodily ailments are not to be swallowed casually morning, noon, and night. 
how much less then this poisonous fiery goldstone, which the viscera of man must be utterly unable to digest. Thus gradually Taoism lost its early simple characteristics associated with the name of Lao Tzu. The Tao developed by Zhuang Tzu, in the light of which all things became one, paved the way for one concrete ruler of the universe, and the dazzling centre, far away in space, became the heaven which was to be the resting place of virtuous mortals after death. Then came Buddhism, with its attractive ritual and its manifold consolations, and put an end once for all to the ancient glories of the teachings of Lao Tzu. The older textbooks date the first appearance of Buddhism in China from 67 AD, when in consequence of a dream the reigning emperor sent a mission to the west, and was rewarded by obtaining copies of parts of the canon, brought to China by Kashyam Padunga, an Indian priest, who, after translating a portion into Chinese, fell ill and died. But we know now that Buddhist monks had already appeared in China so early as 230 BC. The monks were thrown into prison, but were said to have been released in the night by an angel. Still, it was not until the third or fourth century of our era that the new religion began to make itself appreciably felt. When this came about, there ensued a long and fierce struggle between the Buddhists and the Taoists, resulting, after alternating triumphs and defeats on both sides, in that mutual tolerance which obtains at the present day. Each religion began early to borrow from the other. In the words of the philosopher Zhu Xi of the 11th century, Buddhism stole the best features of Taoism. Taoism stole the worst features of Buddhism. It is as though one took a jewel from the other, and the loser recouped the loss with a stone. From Buddhism the Taoists borrowed their whole scheme of temples, priests, nuns, and ritual. They drew up liturgies to resemble the Buddhist sutras, and also prayers for the dead. They adopted the idea of a trinity, consisting of Lao Tzu, the mythological Adam of China, and the ruler of the universe before mentioned. And they further appropriated the Buddhist purgatory, with all its frightful terrors and tortures after death. Nowadays it takes an expert to distinguish between the temples and priests of the two religions, and members of both hierarchies are often simultaneously summoned by persons needing religious consolation, or ceremonial of any kind. The pure and artless Tao of Lao Tzu, etherealized by the lofty speculations of Zhuang Tzu, has long since become the vehicle of base and worthless superstition. End of Lecture 5「Recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. China and the Chinese by Herbert Allen Giles. Lecture 6 Some Chinese Manners and Customs. A foreigner arriving for the first time in China will be especially struck by three points to which he is not accustomed at home. The people will consist almost entirely of men. They will all wear their hair plaited in queues, and they will all be exactly alike. The seclusion of women causes the traveller least surprise of the three, being a custom much more rigorously enforced in other oriental countries, and directly he gets accustomed to the uniform absence of beard and moustache, he soon finds out that the Chinese people are not one whit more alike facially than his own countrymen of the West. A Chinaman cannot wear a beard before he is forty, unless he happens to have a married son. He also shaves the whole head, with the exception of a round patch at the back, from which the much-prized queue is grown. 
There are some strange misconceptions as to the origin and meaning of the queue, more perhaps on the other side of the Atlantic, where we are not so accustomed to Chinamen as you are in America. Some associate the queue with religion, and gravely state that without it no Chinaman can be hauled into paradise. Others know that queues have only been worn by the Chinese for about 250 years, and that they were first imposed as a badge of conquest by the Manchu Tatars, the present rulers of China. Previous to 1644, the Chinese clothed their bodies and dressed their hair in the style of the modern Japanese. Of course, I mean those Japanese who still wear what is wrongly known as the beautiful native dress of Japan. Wrongly, because as a matter of fact, the Japanese borrowed their dress, as well as their literature, philosophy, and early lessons in art, from China. The Japanese dress is the dress of the Ming period in China. 1368 to 1644. It remains to be seen whence and wherefore the Manchu Tartars obtained this strange fashion of the queue. The Tartars may be said to have depended, almost for their very existence, upon the horse, and in old pictures the Tartar is often seen lying curled up asleep with his horse, illustrating the mutual affection and dependence between master and beast. Out of sheer gratitude and respect for his noble ally, the man took upon himself the form of the animal, growing a queue in imitation of the horse's tail. Unsupported by any other evidence, this somewhat grotesque theory would fall to the ground, but there is other evidence of a rather striking character, which, taken in conjunction with what has been said, seems to me to settle the matter. Official coats, as seen in China at the present day, are made with very peculiar sleeves, shaped like a horse's leg, and ending in what is an unmistakable hoof, completely covering the hand. These are actually known to the Chinese as horseshoe sleeves, and encased therein, a Chinaman's arms certainly look very much like a horse's forelegs. The tail completes the picture. When the Tartars conquered China 250 years ago, there was at first a strenuous fight against the queue, and it has been said that the turbans still worn by the southern Chinese were originally adopted as a means of concealing the hateful Manchu badge. Nowadays, every Chinaman looks upon his queue as an integral and honourable part of himself. If he cannot grow one, he must have recourse to art, for he could not appear tailless, either in this world or the next. False cues are to be seen hanging in the streets for sale. They are usually worn by burglars, and come off in your hand when you think you've caught your man. Prisoners are often led to and from jail by their cues, sometimes three or four being tied together in a gang. False hair is not confined entirely to the masculine queue. Chinese ladies often use it as a kind of chignon, and it is an historical fact that a famous empress, who set aside the emperor and ruled China with an Elizabethan hand from A.D. 684 to 705, used to present herself in the council chamber before her astonished ministers, fortified with an artificial beard. Dyeing the hair, too, has been practised in China, certainly from the Christian era, if not earlier, chiefly by men whose hair and beards begin to grow grey too soon. One of the proudest titles of the Chinese, carrying them back as it does to prehistoric times, is that of the black-haired people, also a title, perhaps a mere coincidence, of the ancient Akkadians. In spite, however, of the universality of black hair in both men and women, there are exceptions to the rule, and I myself have seen a Chinese albino, with the usual light-coloured hair and pink eyes. The Reverend Dr. Arthur Smith, an American missionary, has long been known for his keen insight into the workings of the Chinese mind. In his last book, China in Convulsion, under the head of Protestant Missions, he makes the following important statement, 
important not only to those who intend to take part in missionary work, but also to the official, to the explorer, and to the merchant. It would be unfair, he says, not to point out that when a large body of Occidentals, imperfectly acquainted with the Chinese language, etiquette, modes of thought, and intellectual presuppositions, begins on a large and universal scale the preaching of an uncompromising system of morals and doctrines like Christianity, there must be much which, unconsciously to themselves, rouses Chinese prejudices. The following maxim comes from Confucius. If you visit a foreign state, ask what the prohibitions are. If you go into a strange neighborhood, inquire what the manners and customs are. Certainly it is altogether desirable that a foreigner going to China, whether in an official capacity or as a merchant, missionary or traveller, should have some acquaintance with the ordinary rules and ceremonial of Chinese social life. Such knowledge will often go far to smooth away Chinese prejudices against the barbarian, and on occasions might conceivably aid in averting a catastrophe. It is true that Lao Tzu said, Ceremonies are but the veneer of loyalty and good faith. His words, however, have not prevailed against the teaching of Confucius, who was an ardent believer in the value of ceremonial. One of the latter's disciples wished, as a humanitarian, to abolish the sacrifice of a sheep upon the first day of every month. But Confucius rebuked him, saying, My son, you love the sheep, I love the ceremony. When, during his last visit to England, Li Hongzhang made remarks about Mr. Chamberlain's eyeglass, he was considered by many to be wanting in common politeness. But from the Chinese point of view, it was Mr. Chamberlain who was offending, quite unwittingly of course, against an important canon of good taste. It is a distinct breach of Chinese etiquette to wear spectacles while speaking to an equal, the Chinese invariably remove their glasses when conversing. For what reason I have never been able to discover. One thing is quite certain, they do not like being looked at through a medium of glass or crystal, and it costs the foreigner nothing to fall in with their harmless prejudice. Chinese street etiquette is also quite different from our own, a fact usually ignored by blustering foreigners, who march through a Chinese town as if the place belonged to them, and not infrequently complain that coolies and others will not get out of their way. Now there is a graduated scale of Chinese street rights in this particular respect, to which, as being recognized by the Chinese themselves, it would be advisable for foreigners to pay some attention. In England it has been successfully maintained that the roadway belongs to all equally, foot passengers, equestrians, and carriage passengers alike. Not so in China. The ordinary foot passenger is bound to get out of the way of the lowest coolie who is carrying a load. The same coolie must make way, even at great inconvenience to himself, for a sedan chair. An empty chair yields the way to a chair with somebody inside. A chair, inasmuch as being more manageable, gets out of the way of a horse. And a horse, chair, coolie, and foot-passenger all clear the road for a wedding or other procession, or for the retinue of a mandarin. At the same time, a Chinaman may stop his cart or barrow, or dump down his load, just wherever he pleases, and other persons have to make the best of what is left of the road. I have even seen a theatrical stage being built right across a street, completely blocking it, so that all traffic had to be diverted from its regular course. There are no municipal regulations, and no police in China, so that the people have to arrange things among themselves, and, considering the difficulties inherent in such an absence of government, it may fairly be said that they succeed remarkably well. When two friends meet in the street, either may put up his fan and screen his face, whereupon the other will pass by without a sign of recognition, 
the meaning is simply, too busy to stop for a chat, and the custom, open and above board as it is, compares favourably, perhaps, with the not-at-home of Western civilization. I do not know of any Chinese humorist who ever, as in the old story, shouted out to a visitor, I'm not at home. Confucius himself certainly came very near to doing so. It is on record that when an unwelcome visitor came to call, the sage sent out to say that he was too ill to receive guests. At the same time, seizing his harpsichord and singing to it from an open window, in order to expose the hollowness of his own plea. Anyone on horseback, or riding in a sedan chair, who happens to meet a friend walking, must dismount before venturing to salute him. However, to obviate the constant inconvenience of so doing, the foot passenger is in duty bound to screen his face as above, and thus, by a fiction which deceives nobody, much unnecessary trouble is saved. When two mandarins of equal rank find themselves face to face in their sedan chairs, those attendants among their retinues who carry the enormous wooden fans rush forward and insert these between the two passing chairs, so that their masters may be presumed not to see each other, and consequently not be obliged to get out. No subordinate can ever meet a higher mandarin in his way. The former must turn down some by-street immediately on hearing the approaching gong of his superior officer. A mandarin's rank can be told by the number of consecutive strokes on the gong, ranging from thirteen for a viceroy to seven for a magistrate. Take the case of a Chinese visitor. He should be received at the front door and be conducted by the host to a reception room, the host being careful to see that the visitor is always slightly in advance. The act of sitting down should be simultaneous, so that neither party is standing while the other is seated. If the host wishes to be very attentive, he may take a cup of tea from his servant's hands and himself arrange it for his guest. Here comes another most important and universal rule. In handing anything to, or receiving anything from, an equal, both hands must be used. A servant should hand a cup of tea with both hands, except when serving his master and a guest. Then he takes one cup in each hand, and hands them with the arms crossed. I was told that the crossing was in order to exhibit to each the heart, i.e. the palm, of the hand, in token of loyalty. There is a curious custom in connection with the invariable cup of tea served to a visitor on arrival, which is often violated by foreigners to the great amusement of the Chinese. The tea in question, known as guest tea, is not intended for ordinary drinking purposes, for which wine is usually provided. No sooner does the guest raise the cup of tea to his lips, or even touch it with his hand, than a shout is heard from the servants, which means that the interview is at an end, and that the visitor's sedan chair is to be got ready. Drinking this tea is in fact a signal for departure. The host may similarly, without breach of good manners, be the first to drink, and thus delicately notify the guest that he has business engagements elsewhere. Then again, it is the rule to place the guest at one's left hand, though curiously enough this only dates from the middle of the fourteenth century, previous to which the right hand was the place of honour. Finally, when the guest takes his leave, it is proper to escort him back to the front door. That, at any rate, is sufficient, though it is not unusual to accompany a guest some part of his return journey. In fact, the Chinese proverb says, If you escort a man at all, escort him all the way. This, however, is rhetorical rather than practical, somewhat after the style of another well-known Chinese proverb. If you bow at all, bow low. A Chinese invitation to dinner differs somewhat from a similar compliment in the West. You will receive a red envelope containing a red card, red being the colour associated with festivity, 
on which it is stated that by noon on a given day the floor will be swept, the wine cups washed, and your host in waiting to meet your chariot. Later on, a second invitation will arrive, couched in the same terms, and again another on the day of the banquet, asking you to be punctual to the minute. To this you pay no attention, but make preparations to arrive at about 4 p.m., previous to which another and more urgent summons may very possibly have been sent. All this is conventional, and the guests assemble at the same hour to separate about 9 p.m. Women take no part in Chinese social entertainments except among their own sex. It is not even permissible to inquire after the wife of one's host. Her very existence is ignored. A man will talk with pleasure about his children, especially if his quiver is well stocked with boys. In this connection I may say that the position of women in China still seems to be very widely misunderstood. Not only that, but a very frightful crime is alleged against the Chinese people as a common practice in everyday life, which, if not actually approved, meets everywhere with toleration. I allude to the charge of infanticide, confined of course to girls, for it has not often been suggested that Chinese parents do away with such a valuable asset as a boy. Miss Gordon Cumming, the traveller, in her wanderings in China, has the following impassioned paragraph in reference to her visit to Ningbo. The delicate fragrance of the roses and honeysuckle, alas, cannot overpower the appalling odours which here and there assail us, poisoning the freshness of the evening breezes. These are wafted from the baby towers, two of which we had to pass. These are square towers with small windows, about twelve feet from the ground somewhat resembling pigeon towers. These strange dovecotes are built to receive the bodies of such babies as die too young to have fully developed souls, and therefore there is no necessity to waste coffins on them, or even to make the trouble of burying them in the bosom of Mother Earth. So the insignificant little corpse is handed over to a coolie, who, for the sum of forty cash, equal to about five cents, carries it away, ostensibly to throw it into one of these towers. But if he should not choose to go so far, he gets rid of it somehow. No questions are asked, and there are plenty of prowling dogs ever on the watch, seeking what they may devour. Today several poor uncoffined mites were lying outside the towers, shrouded only in a morsel of old matting. Apparently they had been brought by someone who had failed to throw them in at the window about twelve feet from the ground, in which, by the way, one had stuck fast. Some of these poor little creatures are brought here alive and left to die, and some of these have been rescued and carried to foundling hospitals. The neighbourhood was so pestiferous that we could only pause a moment to look at an institution, which, although so horrible, is so characteristic of this race, who pay such unbounded reverence to the powerful dead who could harm them. Most of the bodies deposited here are those of girl babies who have been intentionally put to death, but older children are often thrown in. With regard to this, I will only say that I lived altogether for over four years within a mile or so of these towers, which I frequently passed during the evening walk, and so far from ever seeing several poor uncoffined mites lying outside the towers, shrouded only in a morsel of old matting, which Miss Gordon Cumming has described, I never even saw one single instance of a tower being put to the purpose for which it was built, viz. as a burying place for the dead infants of people too poor to spend money upon a grave. As for living children being thrown in, I think I shall be able to dispose of that statement a little later on. Miss Gordon Cumming did not add that these towers are cleared out at regular intervals by a Chinese charitable society, which exists for that purpose, the bodies burnt and the ashes reverently buried. Mrs. Bird Bishop, the traveller, is reported to have stated at a public lecture in 1897 
that one of the most distressing features of Chinese life was the contempt for women. Of eleven Bible women whom she had seen at a meeting in China, there was not one who had not put an end to at least five girl babies. A Jesuit missionary has published a quarto volume, running to more than 270 pages, and containing many illustrations of infanticide, and the judgments of heaven which always come upon those who commit this crime. Finally, if you ask of any Chinaman, he will infallibly tell you that infanticide exists to an enormous extent everywhere in China. And as though in corroboration of his words, alongside many a pool in South China may be found a stone tablet bearing an inscription to the effect that female children may not be drowned here, this would appear to end the discussion, but it does not. To begin with, the Chinese are very prone to exaggerate, especially to foreigners, even their vices. They seem to think that some credit may be extracted from anything, provided it is on a sufficiently imposing scale, and I do not at all doubt the fact that eleven Bible women told Mrs. Bird Bishop that they had each destroyed five girl babies. It is just what I should have expected. I remember when I first went to Amoy, it had been stated in print by a reckless foreigner that crucifixion of a most horrible kind was one of the common punishments of the place. On inquiring from the Chinese writer attached to the consulate, the man assured me that the story was quite true, and that I could easily see for myself. I told him that I was very anxious to do so, and promised him a hundred dollars for the first case he might bring to my notice. Three years later, I left Amoy, with the hundred dollars still unclaimed. Further, those Chinese who have any money to spare are much given to good works, chiefly, I feel bound to add, in view of the recompense their descendants will receive in this world, and they themselves in the next. Also, because a rich man who does nothing in the way of charity comes to be regarded with disapprobation by his poorer neighbours. Such persons print and circulate gratis all kinds of religious tracts against gambling, wine-drinking, opium-smoking, infanticide, and so forth, and these are the persons who set up the stone tablets above mentioned, regardless of whether infanticide happens to be practised or not. Of course, infanticide is known in China, just as it is known, too well known, in England and elsewhere. What I hope to be able to show is that infanticide is not more prevalent in China than in the Christian communities of the West. Let me begin by urging what no one who has lived in China will deny, that Chinese parents seem to be excessively fond of all their children, male and female. A son is often spoken of playfully as a little dog, a puppy in fact. A girl is often spoken of as a thousand ounces of gold, a jewel, and so forth. Sons are no doubt preferred, but is that feeling peculiar to the Chinese? A great deal too much has been made of a passage in the Odes, which says that baby sons should have sceptres to play with, while baby daughters should have tiles. The allotment of these toys is not quite so disparaging as it seems. The sceptre is indeed the symbol of rule, but the tile too has an honourable signification, a tile being used in ancient China as a weight for the spindle, and consequently as a symbol of woman's work in the household. Then, again, even a girl has a market value. Some will buy and rear them to be servants, others to be wives for their sons. While native foundling hospitals endowed by charitable Chinese will actually pay a small fee for every girl handed over to them. It is also curious to note how recent careful observers have several times stated that they can find no trace of infanticide in their own immediate districts, though they hear that it is extensively practised in some other, generally distant, parts of the country. 
After all, it is really a question which can be decided inferentially by statistics. Every Chinese youth, when he reaches the age of eighteen, has a sacred duty to perform. He must marry. Broadly speaking, every adult Chinaman in the empire has a wife. Well-to-do merchants, mandarins and others, have subordinate wives, two, three, and even four. The emperor has seventy-two. This being the case, and granting also a widespread destruction of female children, it must follow that girls are born in an overwhelmingly large proportion to boys, utterly unheard of in any other part of the world. Are, then, Chinese women the downtrodden, degraded creatures we used to imagine Muslim women to be? I think this question must be answered in the negative. The young Chinese woman in a well-to-do establishment is indeed secluded, in the sense that her circle is limited to the family and to men's of the same sex. From time immemorial it has been the rule in China that men and women should not pass things to one another, for fear their hands might touch. A local Pharisee tried to entangle the great Mencius in his speech, asking him if a man who saw his sister-in-law drowning might venture to pull her out. A man, replied the philosopher, who failed to do so would be no better than a wolf. The Chinese lady may go out to pay calls, and even visit temples for religious purposes, unveiled, veils for women having been abolished in the first years of the seventh century of our era. Only brides wear them now. Girls are finally separated from boys at seven or eight years of age, when the latter go to school. Some say that Chinese girls receive no education. If so, what is the explanation of the large educational literature provided exclusively for girls? One Chinese authoress, who wrote a work on the education of women, complains that women can never expect more than ten years for their education, i.e. the years between childhood and marriage. The fact is that among the literary classes, girls often receive a fair education, as witness the mass of poetry published by Chinese women. One of the dynastic histories was partly written by a woman. Her brother, who was engaged on it, died, and she completed his work. About the year 235 AD, women were actually admitted to official life, and some of them rose to important government posts. By the 8th century, however, all trace of this system had disappeared. The women of the poorer classes are not educated at all, nor indeed are the men. Both sexes have to work as burden carriers and field labourers, and of course in such cases the restrictions mentioned above cannot be rigorously enforced. Women of the shopkeeper class often display great aptitude for business, and render invaluable assistance to their husbands. As in France, they usually keep the cash-box. A mandarin's seal of office is his most important possession. If he loses it, he may lose his post. Without the seal, nothing can be done. With it, everything. Extraordinary precautions are taken when transmitting new seals from Peking to the provinces. Every official seal is made with four small feet projecting from the four corners of its face, making it look like a small table. Of these, the maker breaks off one when he hands the seal over to the board. Before forwarding to the viceroy of the province, another foot is removed by the board. A third is similarly disposed of by the viceroy, and the last by the official for whose use it is intended. This is to prevent its employment by any other than the person authorised. The seal is then handed over to the mandarin's wife, in whose charge it always remains, she alone having the power to produce it, or withhold it, as required. A Chinese woman shares the titles accorded to her husband, when the latter is promoted, the title of the wife is correspondingly advanced. She also shares all posthumous honours, and her spirit, 
equally with her husband's, is soothed by the ceremonies of ancestral worship. Ancestral worship is a phrase of ominous import, suggesting as it does the famous dispute which began to rage early in the 18th century and is still raging today. In every Chinese house stand small wooden tablets, bearing the names of deceased parents, grandparents, and earlier ancestors. Plates of meat and cups of wine are on certain occasions set before these tablets, in the belief that the spirits of the dead occupy the tablets and enjoy the offerings. The latter are afterward eaten by the family, but pious Chinese assert that the flavour of the food and wine has been abstracted. Similar offerings are made once a year at the tombs where the family ancestors lie buried. The question now arises, are these offerings set forth in the same spirit which prompts us to place flowers on graves, adorn statues, and hold memorial services? If so, a Chinese convert to Christianity may well be permitted to embody these old observances with the ceremonial of his new faith. Or do these observances really constitute worship? That is, are the offerings made with a view to propitiate the spirits of the dead and obtain from them increase of worldly prosperity and happiness? In the latter case, ministers of the Christian faith would of course be justified in refusing to blend ancestral worship with the teachings of Christianity. It would no doubt be very desirable to bring about a compromise and discover some modus vivendi for the Chinese convert, other than that of throwing over Confucianism with all its influence for good, and of severing all family and social ties, and beginning life again as an outcast in his own country. But I feel bound to say that in my opinion these ancestral observances can only be regarded, strictly speaking, as worship and as nothing else. To return to the Chinese woman, she enjoys some privileges not shared by men. She is exempt from the punishment of the bamboo, and as a party to a case, is always more or less a source of anxiety to the presiding magistrate. No Chinaman will enter into a dispute with a woman if he can help it, not from any chivalrous feeling, but from a conviction that he will surely be worsted in the end. If she becomes a widow, a Chinese woman is not supposed to marry again, though in practice she very often does so. A widow who remains unmarried for thirty years may be recommended to the throne for some mark of favour, such as an honorary tablet or an ornamental archway to be put up near her home. It is essential, however, that her widowhood should have begun before she was thirty years of age. Remarriage is viewed by many widows with horror. In my own family I once employed a nurse, herself one of seven sisters, who was a widow, and who had also lost half the little finger of her left hand. The connecting link between these two details is not so apparent to us as it might be to the Chinese. After her husband's death the widow decided that she would never marry again, and in order to seal irrevocably her vow, she seized a meat chopper and lopped off half her finger on the spot. The finger top was placed in her husband's coffin, and the lid was closed. This woman, who was a Christian, and the widow of a native preacher, had large, that is, unbound feet. Nevertheless, she bound the feet of her only daughter, because, as she explained, it is so difficult to get a girl married unless she has small feet. Here we have the real obstacle to the abolition of this horrible custom, which vast numbers of intelligent Chinese would be only too glad to get rid of if fashion did not stand in the way. There has been in existence now for some years a well-meaning association known as the Natural Foot Society, supported by both Chinese and foreigners, with the avowed object of putting an end to the practice of foot-binding. We hear favourable accounts of its progress, but until there is something like a national movement, it will not do to be too sanguine. 
we must remember that in 1664, one of China's wisest and greatest emperors, in the plenitude of his power, issued an imperial edict forbidding parents in future to bind the feet of their girls. Four years later, the edict was withdrawn. The emperor was Kang Si, whose name you have already heard, in connection with the standard dictionary of the Chinese language and other works brought out under his patronage. A Tartar himself, unaccustomed to the sight of Tartar women struggling in such fetters, he had no sympathy with the custom. But against the Chinese people, banded together to safeguard their liberty of action in a purely domestic matter, he was quite unable to prevail. Within the last few weeks, another edict has gone forth, directed against the practice of foot-binding. Let us hope it will have a better fate. Many years ago, the prefect of Taiwan Fu said to me, in the course of an informal conversation, after a friendly dinner, Do you foreigners fear the inner ones? And on my asking what was meant, he told me that a great many Chinese stood in absolute awe of their wives. He does, added the prefect, pointing to the district magistrate, a rather truculent-looking individual, who was at the dinner party, and the other guests went into a roar of laughter. The general statement by the prefect is borne out by the fact that the henpecked husband is constantly held up to ridicule in humorous literature, which would be quite impossible if there were no foundation of fact. I have translated one of these stories, trivial enough in itself, but, like the proverbial straw, well adapted for showing which way the wind blows. Here it is. Ten henpecked husbands agreed to form themselves into a society for resisting the oppression of their wives. At the first meeting they were sitting talking over their pipes, when suddenly the ten wives, who had got wind of the movement, appeared on the scene. There was a general stampede, and nine of the husbands incontinently bolted through another door, only one remaining unmoved to face the music. The ladies merely smiled contemptuously at the success of their raid, and went away. The nine husbands then all agreed that the bold tenth man, who had not run away, should be at once appointed their president, but on coming to offer him the post, they found out that he had died of fright. To judge by the following story, the Chinese woman's patience is sometimes put to a severe test. A scholar of old was so absent-minded that on one occasion, when he was changing houses, he forgot to take his wife. This was reported to Confucius as a most unworthy act. Nay, replied the master, it is indeed bad to forget one's wife, but tis worse to forget one's self. Points of this kind are no doubt trivial, as I have said above, and may be regarded by many even as flippant. But the fact is that a successful study of the Chinese people cannot possibly be confined to their classics and higher literature, and to the problem of their origin and subsequent development, where we now find them. It must embrace the lesser, not to say meaner, details of their everyday life. If we are ever to pierce the mystery, which still to a great extent surrounds them, in this sense, an Italian student of Chinese, Baron Vitale, has gone so far as to put together and publish a collection of Chinese nursery rhymes, from which it is not difficult to infer that Chinese babies are very much as other babies are in other parts of the world. And it has always seemed to me that the Chinese baby's father and mother, so far as the ordinary springs of action go, are very much of a pattern with the rest of mankind. One reason why the Chinaman remains a mystery to so many is due, no doubt, to the vast amount of nonsense which is published about him. First of all, China is a very large country, and from want of proper means of communication for many centuries, there has been nothing like extensive intercourse between North, South, East, West, and Central. Of course, the officials visit all parts of the empire, as they are transferred from post to post, but the bulk of the people never go far beyond the range of their own district city. 
The consequence is that as regards manners and customs, while retaining an indelible national imprint, the Chinese people have drifted apart into separate local communities, so that what is true of one part of the country is by no means necessarily true of another. The Chinese themselves say that manners, which they think are due to climatic influences, change every thirty miles. Customs, which they attribute to local idiosyncrasies, change every three hundred miles. Now a globetrotter goes to Canton, and as one of the sites of that huge collection of human beings, he is taken to shops, uh, there used to be three, where the flesh of dogs fed for the purpose is sold as food. He comes home and writes a book and says that the Chinese people live on dog's flesh. When I was a boy, I thought that every Frenchman had a frog for breakfast. Each statement would be about equally true. In the north of China, dog's flesh is unknown, and even in the south, during all my years in China, I never succeeded in finding any Chinaman who either could or would admit that he had actually tasted it. Take the random statement that any rich man condemned to death can procure a substitute by payment of so much. So long as we believe stuff of that kind, so long will the Chinese remain a mystery to us, it being difficult to deduce true conclusions from false premises. As a matter of fact, that is, so far as my own observations go, the Chinese people value life every whit as highly as we do, and a substitute of the kind would be quite unprocurable under ordinary circumstances. It is thinkable that some poor wretch, himself under sentence of death, might be substituted with the connivance of the officials to hoodwink foreigners, but even then the difficulties would be so great as to render the scheme almost impracticable. For in China everything leaks out. There is none of that secrecy necessary to conceal and carry out such a plot. At any rate, the uncertainty which gathers around many of these points emphasizes the necessity of more and more accurate scholarship in Chinese and more and more accurate information on the people of China and their ways. How the latter article is supplied to us in England, you may judge from some extracts which I have recently taken from respectable daily and weekly newspapers. For instance, China has only 100 physicians to a population of 400 million. To me it is inconceivable how such rubbish can be printed especially when it is quite easy to find out that there is no medical diploma in China, and that any man who chooses is free to set up as a doctor. By a pleasant fiction he charges no fee. A fixed sum, however, is paid to him for each visit, as horse money, I need hardly add, in advance. There are, as with us, many successful and consequently fashionable doctors whose horse money runs well into double figures. Their success must be due more to good luck and strictly innocent prescriptions than to any guidance they can find in the extensive medical literature of China. Altogether, medicine is a somewhat risky profession, as failure to cure is occasionally resented by surviving relatives. There is a story of a doctor who had mismanaged a case, and was seized by the patient's family and tied up. In the night he managed to free himself, and escaped by swimming across a river. When he got home he found his son, who had just begun to study medicine, and he said to him, Don't be in a hurry with your books. The first and most important thing is to learn to swim. Here is another newspaper gem. In China, the land of opposites, the dials of the clocks are made to turn round, while the hands stand still. Personally, I never noticed this arrangement. Again, some of the tops with which the Chinese amuse themselves are as large as barrels. It takes three men to spin one, and it gives off a sound that may be heard several hundred yards away. The Chinese national anthem is so long that it takes half a day to sing it. Chinese women devote very little superfluous time to hairdressing. Their tresses are arranged once a month, 
and they sleep with their heads in boxes. What we want in place of all this is a serious and systematic examination of the manners and customs and modes of thought of the Chinese people. Their long line of dynastic histories must be explored, and their literature ransacked by students who have got through the early years of drudgery inseparable from the peculiar manner of the written language, and who are prepared to devote themselves, not as we do now, to a general knowledge of the whole, but to a thorough acquaintance with some particular branch. The immediate advantages of such a course, as I must point out once more, for the last time, to commerce and to diplomatic relations will be incalculable, and they will be shared in by the student of history, philosophy and religion, who will then, for the first time, be able to assign to China her proper place in the family of nations. The founder of this Chinese chair has placed these advantages within the grasp of Columbia University. End of Lecture 6 Some Chinese Manners and Customs End of China and the Chinese by Herbert Allen Giles Read for LibriVox by David Barnes, London, April and May 2006